morning once again. I welcome you to Calvary Chapel. Once again, Roger and Denise are away. And Roger asked me, Rich, can you do a message? And then I thought about the chapter or the verses that I was going to do. I said, yeah, I can do that. And then I started studying. I went, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? As you go through God's Word, and He starts to peel away the layers, and He goes, wow, that's some powerful stuff. So, before we begin, Lord, we thank You that You've given us Your Word. Lord, we thank You that You've given us Your Spirit to help us, to guide us, to teach us. So may Your Spirit fall on us today, Lord. May Your Spirit touch us in a special way that, Father, you will speak to us directly. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be in John 15. If you don't have a Bible, please raise your hand and we'll have an usher bring you one and uh, we can get you there. So, John 15, of course, is in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then after that, you got Acts and Romans. Um, I sat under a pastor. He could recite the names of the books of the Bible forward, and then he could go backwards. How does he do that? It was crazy. So, John 15, but before we get there, Pastor Roger encouraged me. He said, read the chapters before and read the chapters afterwards. So that's what I did. And those of you that know me know that I like to listen to Scripture too. If you can listen to an entire book, it may take you an hour, an hour and a half or whatever, you get a meaning and you start to see the threads that start to come through that book. So I read the first couple chapters before John 15 and then a couple afterwards. And it's really interesting. And I want to set the stage before we get to John 15. So it's the Passover feast just before the Passover feast. And dinner has just ended. And then we come to chapter 13. Dinner has just ended and Jesus now takes it upon himself to wash the disciples' feet. And you know the story. Peter goes, Lord, not my feet. And Jesus tells him, if I don't do this, then you have no part of me. And then Peter backtracks and he goes, not my feet, Lord, my whole body. He said, wait, 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 slow down. As my kids would say, slow your roll, pilgrim, slow your roll. So he washes the disciples' feet, and then comes one of those crucial moments in the story where Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And there's a murmur in the room. Which one, which one, which one? Ask him, ask him, ask him. Go ahead, ask him. He says, it's the one who sups with me takes his bread from my hand is the one that's going to betray me. And then, of course, he dips the bread and he hands it to Judas. Whatsoever you do, do it quickly. And Judas leaves. That's a crucial piece of information as we move on. But Judas now leaves because Satan has entered him. So now you have Jesus and the 11 disciples. Then he goes, a new commandment I give unto you. Love one another. As I have loved you. Jesus is setting the stage. You know what's going to happen next. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be crucified. He knows this. And he's preparing his disciples for what's coming up. You ever do that with your children? With a friend, a close friend and go, you don't want to do that. You're going to be in for a world of hurt. This is kind of the flip of that. Jesus goes, there's a world of hurt coming. I'm going to prepare you for it. So he says, a new commandment I give unto you. Love, love one another as I have loved you. Or love one another as I'm going to show you how I love you. Wow. And then Jesus foretells of Peter's denial. Peter, once again, you got to love this guy because we can relate to him. How many times do we put our foot in our mouth and then go, okay, God, thank you. Peter goes, no way, Lord. Jesus goes, 
Let me tell you. Let me tell you. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And then we move on to chapter 14. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now, I heard an illustration one time that talked about back in that culture, there was the man of the house. He, of course, he would have his house. And um, <clears throat> if he had kids, they would come of that age where they would marry. And it happens now sometimes. Maybe not so much, but there would be an engagement, then the betrothal, and it would take some time for that to happen. Well, during that time, the master of the house would add on another room for the newly married couple. And they would live with them. And I think about that, and I think about this. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that the mansion or the house that God has in heaven, I'm going to be right there. I hope that's encouraging to you, that you are going to be there. And then he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And once again, as he goes through this discourse, I and my Father are one. Because they're interested. Jesus, show us the Father. And he says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. I and my Father are one. Then he talks about answered prayer. We'll get into that a little bit later on too. Ask whatever you will, and my Father will give to you. And then... The promise of the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm leaving. If I leave, it's better for you because now the Spirit comes into you. And the Spirit will abide in you forever. Oh, what a sweet promise. Keep in mind the setting where we are. He knows. This is the time. It's going to happen. It's going to get real. And he goes on and he says, The indwelling of Jesus and the Father. Once again, how the two of them kind of interconnect and go. And then he says this. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. There's going to be a world of hurt. A world of hurt. It's going to get real. But my peace I leave with you. Read between those lines. My peace I leave with you. It's going to be chaos. It's going to be crazy. But my peace I leave with you. And then at the end of chapter 14 he says, Arise, let us go away from here. Now some people believe that this was his, uh, his direction to say, Okay, now we're going to leave and we're going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. We're going to get this process going. Jesus came down to this earth to die for you and me. And he's saying, let's do this. Let's do this. And I imagine, it's one of those things, you know how you do it. You walk with people and you just kind of talk and you walk with them and you're just kind of talking and, and you're just kind of having a conversation, you know, just very nonchalantly, just back and forth walking. And then we come to John 15. And he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. A lot of stuff wrapped up into there. 
Especially when you consider what's going to happen. Let's do this. The time has come. And Jesus even gets to the point. You know he gets into the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays to the Father, Lord, if there be any other way. If there be any other way. And then the realization is there. This is the only way. There's times when I pray to God and I go, Lord, this is hard. This is hard, Lord. Can we find an easier way to do this? And he gently whispers into my ear, Rich, this is the easy way. And I go, wow. God loves me that much that he doesn't let me deal with the hard stuff. He gives me the easy way because he knows what I can handle. And Jesus knows what is about to happen. It's going to get real. Be prepared. So he starts off with, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Throughout the book of John, you'll see I am statements from Jesus. In John 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. And you can think about all the ramifications you can talk about. So what is bread, and and what's the significance of that, and what is life, and what's the significance of that? And I'll let you guys do that on your own. We're not going to talk about that here. Later on, John 8, he says, I am the light of the world. What's again, what's the light? What's the world? You know, stuff like that. You you could probably, driving back and forth to work, just ruminate on those for hours. I am the door in John 10. Once again, in John 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. Not just any shepherd. I am the good shepherd. John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Keep in mind, there's a group of people that didn't believe in a resurrection. John 14, we just talked about it. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then here in John 15, where he says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. There's a lot of vines out there, but I'm the true vine. So let's talk about that. Let's, let's linger on that for a little bit. What is truth? We run into situations now where people say, that's true for you, but not for me. I'm like, is, is that really true then? Is that statement in itself true? It, 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 it can't be. That's kind of like saying, I can't speak English. Well, of course I can. I just did. It's like, come on, you see, you see the, the conflict there. So if it's true for you, it's true for me. Jesus says, I am the true vine. It's true for everybody. It's true at all times. I am the true vine. Be careful of all the other vines. And my father is the vine dresser. He's the one who's going to take care of us. So keep that in mind when Jesus says, I am the true vine. Now, there's one other I am statement that you will see throughout the book of John. And that is simply, I am. So when Moses said to God, who shall I say? What's your name so I can tell them who sent me? He said, I am. Some people interpret that out. I am that I am. And people claim that Jesus never claimed to be God. I am. I am. That's where he claims to be God. And he says it throughout the book of John on a number of occasions. So I am. So it's interesting. When Jesus says I am, that should be one of those things where your ears should kind of perk up and go, okay, what's he going to say next? Moving on to verse 2, he says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. And this was one of those verses when I looked at it and I went, Oh my gosh, what did I get into? But as you study it, and as you read it, you start to understand, Oh, this is sweet. He's giving them direction. 
right before he's going to be tortured, beaten beyond recognition. He's given them a warning, too, later on in, in this chapter. But every branch of me that bears does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. So who is he talking to? There's some discussion. Is he talking to Christians? Is he talking to non-Christians? So remember when we gave you a little bit of the foundation, who's he talking to? He's talking to his 11 disciples. Judas is no longer with him. It's just Jesus and his 11 disciples. So I believe wholeheartedly that when he's talking and he says, every branch that is in me, he's talking about Christians. He's talking about believe, people who believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Because there are some people that say, well, no, he can't be, and they, and they start to, to look through this. But he's talking to believers. Now, every believer that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And what does that mean? What does that mean to understand it? And then you start to say, what does that mean to teach it? So the word take away. When you come across something like this, it's a good philosophy in studying your Bible to look at other portions in Scripture that have those words in it. Once again, you want to be careful not to take this out of context. You know, I'm sure you've heard the story about Judas opens up his Bible, or this person that opens up his Bible and says, whatever that Scripture says, that's what I'm doing. And it says, and Judas went therefore and hung himself. And you go, wait a minute, I can't do that. Let's try this again. So they open it up and Whatever so thou doest, doest quickly. You know, so you can't do that. You've got to look in context. So turn with me back to John eleven forty one. This is where Lazarus has died and Jesus has come to his tomb. An emotional time. And the sisters of Lazarus are saying, you know, Lord, if you'd have been here, this wouldn't have happened. And then in verse 41, it says, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, and then, of course, he, he talks about the whole reason why he's there. And he tells Lazarus to rise from the dead. So they took away the stone. The Greek word there is aero, A-I-R-O. They took away. And Jesus lifted up his eyes. Lifted up is that same Greek word, aero, A-I-R-O. Took away, lifted up. Took away, lifted up. Go back to chapter 15. <clears throat> Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Same Greek word, aero, A-I-R-O. So am I going to interpret that takes away, lifts up? Let's look at the context. Once again, Jesus is going to be beaten beyond recognition. Let's look at the character of God. If we mess up one time, is God going to kick us to the curb? Is he going to throw us out the door? You screwed up. You messed up. You sinned. You missed the mark. Bye. Be done with you. No, we know the character of God. It said it earlier in chapter 14 or chapter 13. The promise of the Spirit that's going to abide with you, that's going to come alongside of you, that's going to help you. So in this verse, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. I believe that means he lifts up. You're a branch. Sometimes branches fall to the ground. Sometimes they get covered by the other branches. God is going to lift you up gently. He's going to lift you up off the ground and he's going to bring you to the top so that you can see the light, so that you can feel the warmth of that sunlight. He's going to be compassionate with you. God is Loving, caring, faithful, compassionate. 
I am. He's going to care for you. He wants you to bear fruit. So he's going to lift you up. He's going to take care of you so that you can bear fruit. Once again, it shows his compassion, his grace, and his long-suffering. So now let's look at the second part of that verse where it says, any branch that bears fruit, he prunes. I'm like, wait a minute, God. I'm doing it. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. I'm bearing fruit. And you're going to prune me? Really? That hurts. It hurts. I don't want to be pruned. Nobody likes that. That hurts. But this is a way for you to bear more fruit. And I have an illustration. When, when Rhonda and I lived in New Jersey, well, actually, when we first got married, we went through premarital counseling. And, you know, the pastor said, I encourage you to get, you know, your, your wife's favorite flowers and stuff like that and do this for her and do little things for my wife. And, uh, you know, we had a discussion. And Rhonda told me, she said, don't ever buy me roses. I went, okay. She said, instead, buy a rose bush. Hmm, that's pretty wise. I can give you a dozen roses, and within a matter of a week or two, they'll die. But if I get you a rose bush, it's perpetual, as long as we take care of it. So we did our research, and we came across this variety of roses called Mr. Lincoln Roses. Bright red, fragrant Beautiful roses. And we had two bushes in front of our house. <clears throat> and you've heard the, the phrase, stop and smell the flowers. That's what I would do every once in a while. I would just come home, and these beautiful roses would be there, and I would go, oh, that is so sweet. And there would be times when all I would have to do is just get out of my car, and the fragrance would just fill the, the, the yard. It was crazy. The point I bring up the roses is, th is the stem would come up and there would be a bloom right on top of the roses. But then if you went down about two inches, there would be all these secondary blooms. And what we would do is we would come out as this stem would come up and the bloom would be on top and all the secondary blooms, we would pinch those off. Just gently pinch them off. So that stem only had one bloom right at the top. And I will tell you, and this is marvelous. Huge blossoms on this rose bush. Huge. Because all of the energy, all of the nutrients now went to that one blossom. And you just kind of go up and you go, That's sweet. That's beautiful. God does that to us. You don't need that. Snap. You don't need that. Snap. You don't need that. Snap. And then what happens to us? We blossom. And God goes. That's a sweet smelling sacrifice. The fruit that we give to God. And yes, it hurts when, we, when he prunes us. God, don't do that. But the fruit that we have, because he does that, is so much greater, so much sweeter. So verse 3 says, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken you, you are already clean. And I like the way the King James puts this. It says, now you are clean <clears throat> through the word which I have spoken unto you. So this, the word right here, this is what works in our life. As you read it and you come across that section where God might be pruning you, you don't need that. Sometimes that hurts. Lord, I don't want to give that up. 
I don't want to have to worry about that. He goes, no, you take care of that and your fruit will be much better. Your fruit will be glorious. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you. Unless you abide in me, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. One more time. Without me, you can do nothing. One more time, just for emphasis. Without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Abiding. What does that mean? I've always been taught that abiding is just resting. Just remaining. Just be there. All you got to do is just tap in to the power of the vine. Tap into God. He's got the power. He's got it covered. Because anything that we do on our own power is going to be worthless. But if we tap into God, if we tap into Him, His everlasting eternal power will work through us so that that fruit is beautiful, wonderful. One author puts it, it says, Our spirits can become weary from straining after God. As I grow older, I've gotten to really appreciate times when I can just sit and rest in God. I grab a cup of tea, and I sit out on my back porch. I'll read through Scripture, or I'll listen to music. I just really appreciate it. There's a song out there called Breathe. You may have heard it. And it's very interesting. I love the way they put this together. At the very beginning of the song, it talks about the morning. It's got a big beat. Got my third cup of joe. Got to do this and do that. You can just imagine the chaos. And those of you who have kids, have imagined the chaos. Got to do this. Got to do this. Then the chorus comes in and goes, just breathe. And that beat goes away. Just breathe. And that's perfect. Because we get caught up in ourselves. We get caught up in what we're doing. Oh, I got to do this, got to do that, got to do this, got to do that, got to do this, got to. Just breathe. Just breathe. Just abide in God. How many times have you walked by, say, a citrus tree out here in Arizona? Orange, lemons, limes. Next time you do that, I want you just to stop. You can get right up next to it and listen. Just listen and see if it's going. Come on, come on. There's your orange. Never heard it. I have never heard it. The tree just is. The fruit happens. Just like that author says, sometimes straining after God. Come on, God, show me, show me, show me, show me, show me. It's not going to happen. Any fruit, once again, that we do on our accord is going to be worthless. 1 Corinthians 3.12 states this, If anyone builds on this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, each one's work shall be revealed. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try each one's work as to what kind it is. So if I do stuff on my own accord, that wood, hay, and stubble, what happens if you put that in fire? Oh, that's not going to last very long. 
the gold, the silver, the precious stones, that's what's going to happen. That's where it's going to be. Verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire as they are burned. This is another one of those verses I looked at and I said, what have I gotten myself into? But we read through this. We've talked about God lifting us up so that we can see the sunlight. Either S-O-N or S-U-N, however you want to spell that. But God has limits. He's going to give you everything that you need to produce fruit. He's going to give it to you. He's going to lift you up. He's going to send the Spirit to come alongside of you that's going to help you out. But at some point, if you keep turning away and you say, No, God, I don't want that. No, God, I don't want that. He's going to say, Enough. Enough. Now, I want to be clear on this. He's not telling you that you're going to lose your salvation because he just told them earlier that the Spirit would abide in you forever. But what he's going to do, he's going to remove his help from you. You're on your own. And we've learned that wood, that hay, and that stubble is not going to last because just like the analogy that God uses of the body, some of us are the eye, some of us are the, the, the ear or the, the, the leg or whatever, the brain, the mouth or whatever. If it's not useful to the body, he's going to pull it out. So there's a very strong warning. But God encourages them. He says, Look, at the very beginning, I will lift you up. I am there. Stick with me. And I can imagine him walking. You know, you walk with somebody and you're talking, and then every once in a while they stop. And they look right in your eyes. Stay with me. Abide with me. Now that I have your attention, abide with me. It's like, it's going to get real. They're going to test you. They're going to try you. Peter, you're going to deny me. Stay with me. And sometimes it hurts that you see people week after week in church and then something difficult comes along. And then you don't see them as often. You don't hear about them. Stay abiding in the vine. But there is security in knowing that you are saved and God will not give you up. Like I said, he said the Spirit will abide in you forever. Now verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Wow, there it is. If you abide in me and I have my words abide in you... Go ahead, ask. I'll give it to you. Go ahead. Lord, I want that blue Mustang um, with the spoiler on the back. I want to be able to go 150 miles on 347. No. No. There's some qualifiers here. There are some qualifiers. If you abide in me, And my words abide in you. And he told us earlier that my word is what cleanses you. My word is what makes you pure. So I want you to think about some of the relationships that you've had in your life. Some of those close relationships. Whether it be a marriage or a very good friend that you had. That you got to know them. You spent time with them. Now, Rhonda and I have been married for 35 years. And I'll tell you right now that if I came home from work and she had cooked liver and onions, I am not going to eat it. 
She knows that. Sweetheart, I think I'm going to start fasting. She knows my desires. She knows because we have been together for so long that if she really wants to make me happy with the meal, she'll know what to put on the table or know what to cook. It ain't liver and onions. So this is the same thing. As you commune with God, as you spend time with Him, as you fellowship with Him, you're going to get to know what God wants, what His desire is. And that desire is going to be your desire. It's not about the blue Mustang with the spoiler that can up 347. You're going to spend time with Him and you're going to start praying about the people who are lost. You're going to start praying that God's Spirit would touch this country. You're going to start praying the things that God wants and you're going to be in tune with God because you're tapped into that power of the vine. You're the branch. You're the, vi- uh, he, you're the branch. He is the vine. You can do what without Him? Nothing, not a thing. So as you get to commune with God, you will understand what his desires are. And then finally in verse 8, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Not just fruit, you will bear much fruit. So here's the thing. Develop good habits. You guys remember the movie Karate Kid? Wax on, wax off, paint up, paint down, up, down, wax on. There was a third thing. I forget what it was, but wax on, wax off. Uh, Somebody was doing it. There we go. All right. There we go. Wax on, wax off. As you develop those good habits, all of a sudden he goes, Mr. Miyagi, I don't understand. And then Mr. Miyagi goes, yo, yo. And Daniel's going, whoa, whoa. Oh my gosh. Now I get it. Spend time with God. Wax on. Wax off. Spend time in prayer. What do you get out of a sponge? I've used this before, but what do you get out of a sponge? Whatever you put into it. If you dip that sponge in wine and you pull it out and you give it a squeeze, you're going to get wine out of that sponge. If you dip that sponge in water, you pull it out and give it a squeeze, you're going to get water out of that. Consider yourself a sponge. If you dip yourself in the spiritual that God has for you and you get squeezed from the cares of this world, what's going to come out of you? Whereas if you're looking at the world and you're doing all their philosophies and all their up and down and they squeeze you, what's going to come out of you? So, what are the applications for your life? Yeah, Rich, that's nice and pretty. It's all nice and warm and fuzzy. So what does that mean for me day to day? I'm going to pigtail off of that. Good habits. Give yourself good habits. Develop those good habits. Read the Word, first of all. Read the Word to be cleansed. To be pure. Pray. Not to ask for things, but to commune with God. I spent one year at a Bible Bible college, and one of the professors says, when you read the Word... And when you pray, do this. And I'm going to start at the beginning of John. He said, do this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he said, stop. Listen. Think. He was in the beginning with God. Stop. Listen, let that soak over you. 
And all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. The whole idea is that it's a conversation between you and God. How many times when you have a conversation do you do all the talking? Well, some of us more so than others. We were at the men's study one time. There was only like four or five of us. And they said, uh, it wasn't me, but they asked a the gentleman, can you close us in prayer? Sure. So we all get ready. And Did he hear him? He asked him to lead prayer. And we asked him about that. He says, I've just learned that when I go to God in prayer, to silence my heart. A lot of times we're like, Lord, I need you to do this in my life, do this in my life, do this, breathe. That's funny too, whenever you think about people and they're constantly talking and you look at them and you go, do you ever breathe? Oh my God. But just, Lord, thank you for all that you are. You are gracious, you are wonderful, you are loving. And just relax. And he'll talk to you. Fellowship with one another so that you can be uplifted and so that you can lift others up. Fellowship. Rhonda and I have learned small groups. This is beautiful. This is great. I'll tell you, there is nothing that touches me more when you're leading worship and you guys are there and you're giving it all to God. This is great. But small groups, that's where the real meat and, meat and potatoes is. When you get to know each other and you start to learn about the hurts, the pain, they're just like me. They have the same problems I do. And then you learn about the successes, the triumphs. Yes, we can do this. And you talk about it and you thank you, Lord. Fellowship with one another. Worship. Worship to maintain your perspective. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Puts things into perspective. So your team didn't win. Yours is the kingdom. Take it with you and worship God. Give him the praise. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you and then finally speak the truth speak the truth people are going to ask you why why do you believe I worked in a store I'm a pharmacist I worked in a grocery store in the pharmacy and I went down to the kitchen one time they had they had a kitchen where they would prepare foods to sell to the public and and I went down to this, this chef. Hey, Carrie, what's going on? What you got cooking? Oh, I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this. Oh, that's cool. Oh, and I got this, and I got this, and I got this, and I got this, and I got Oh, that's really cool. Oh, and in the refrigerator, I got this, and this, and this. And I'm like, dude, I was done like five minutes ago. But you see the excitement, the enthusiasm he had in his face. And somebody asked you, why do you believe in God? Ooh. I got this, and I got this, and I got this, and I got this. Oh, that's nice. Oh, and I got this, and I got this, and I got this. Oh, that's nice. And I got this, and I got this. We should have that same enthusiasm. Because when you tell people what God has done in your life, what God has done in your life, they can't argue with you. They can argue about this, but they can't argue what God has done in your life. Go back to that. Speak the truth and speak the truth. In the beginning was the Word, and the words were with, with God, and the Word was God. 
All right, so I want to, in closing, clarify some points. We talked about a lot of stuff. First of all, you cannot, you cannot determine if anyone is saved by the fruit that they are bearing or by the fruit that they are not bearing. That is not for us to decide. And we find this in 1 Samuel 16. They're looking for a king. Samuel's looking for a king. And Jesse starts bringing out his sons. And what about that one? He's tall. He looks like he can take on the world. And God says, no. What about that one? God says, no. But the Lord said to Samuel, do you not consider his appearance or his height? For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. I'm sure you've heard it before. The true character of a person comes out when they do things when people are not looking. The Lord checks the heart. So we cannot, we cannot Look at somebody and judge them by their fruit. Another thing is Jesus. Once again, he's encouraging his disciples. Guys, and I can say this to you guys now, it's going to get real. It's going to get tough. You are going to be challenged. Stay with me. Stay with me. Abide in me. Abide in me. There's going to be times you don't want to abide, but do it. Do it. Do not be discouraged if you don't see fruit. It will come. It will come. In James, he's talking to the poor people. They've been taking abuse from the rich people. And James finishes up in in chapter 5. He says, Therefore, be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and and has patience long for it until receives the early and the latter rain. He says, You also, you also, be patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draws near. And then finally, one other thing. Don't be jealous of anybody else's fruit. Don't be jealous of them. Just take care of yourself. In Proverbs 8, God says, My fruit is better than gold. Yea, than fine gold. And what I give is better than choice silver. God has given us everything to bear fruit. Abide in the vine. Just abide in the vine. It's going to get tough. When I first moved out to Arizona, I came out by myself. Didn't have a job. And then when I did find a job, I was hating life. Because as a pharmacist, when you work retail, it can beat you up. And I had to work retail. And I prayed that prayer the Israelites prayed. God, you brought me out in the desert to die. (laughs) Seriously? But he was gracious. He was faithful. I've got a job that I love. Everything's working out. It was hard. It was tough. And there were times I questioned my faith. Do I really believe what I read? And that's when Jesus says, it's going to get tough. They're going to beat me up beyond recognition. 
They're going to crucify me. They're going to chastise you. They're going to ostracize you. Do you really believe? Abide in the vine. Because outside of that, you can do nothing. But with that, the sky is the limit. Amen? Amen. Lord, we thank you. Your word is so precious. Your word is living. And the truth that is in your word can touch our lives in so many special ways. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit that indwells us forever, that your spirit would just touch us. Your spirit would come alongside of us. Your spirit would encourage us. Your spirit would lift us up. Your spirit would love us. And yes, there are times when your spirit rebukes us. Because, Lord, we know that you love us. As you peel away the dead wood, and you know that the fruit that we're going to produce is going to be so much better. So, Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for allowing us to tap into your eternal power. That, Father, we may bear fruit for you. And that it all would be glorifying to you. We give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.